All right. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So uh, I'm Drew Bartlett, Executive Director of South Florida Water Management District. Uh, we do a lot down there, uh, and I can't wait to present what we do uh, for our ecosystem restoration mission. So this is the South Florida Water Management District's mission statement. Uh, to safeguard and restore South Florida's water resources and ecosystems, protect our communities from flooding, and meet the region's water needs while connecting with stakeholders. Our agency was formed in the 30s, and it was a flood control district. That's all it was. So our mission has evolved a lot over time, and we, may, we get into comprehensive Everglades restoration program for the South Florida table. A lot of good work going on there but I'm gonna focus on a different area on, on how we create partnerships uh, for ecosystem restoration uh, going forward and what we're working on right now. So uh, the Northern Everglades and Estuaries Protection Program that is established in state law and is to protect and restore surface water resources by approving the hydrology and water quality of the Northern Everglades system. And the Northern Everglades system is focusing on Lake Okeechobee, uh, protecting the quality and quantity of water in Lake Okeechobee for its ecosystem, and then the Caloosahatchee and St. Lucie estuaries and Indian River Lagoon at the coasts. And so it's, it's basically broken down into these watersheds that uh, we do a lot of activities in uh, to uh, protect those water bodies. And, ha and the reason those water bodies are impacted is because of the modifications we've done to these systems where, we per, where we've drained the lands to provide uh, working lands uh, for those landscapes. A lot of good uh, activities happen in those landscapes, but it does provide a basically a highway of water to these uh, receiving water bodies that contain pollutants and you know hit, hit them at a velocity that is not desired. So a lot of what we do is, is figuring out how to hold water on the landscape itself. And so one of, the, one of our programs, and I'll get into a few of our programs, but it's, we call it the Dispersed Water Management Program. And so that is basically finding large areas in South Florida that drain to these water bodies and setting them up to hold the water uh, on those areas uh, in, in order to not have it get shunted straight to the water body carrying whatever it carries, but keep it on the landscape, let it interact with the wildlife and the plants on that landscape, take up nutrients before it leaves that landscape and goes down to the receiving water body. And we do this in many different ways. We have uh, private partner, public-private partnerships for this, uh, for this uh, activity, and then we have uh, public initiatives where we own the land and, and put it together, and then we have other kind of treatment ideas. So I'm going to start, I'm going to run through our areas to, to really talk about that. So what we've done with this map, and this is the corridor conference, so you recognize the corridor uh, overlaid on this map, but each of the blue areas that we, we have on this map are projects that we have that provide habitat hold that water, and really you can see can, can provide connecting pieces within a corridor itself. So let's get a little bit more granular on this. So this is the uh, Lake Okeechobee watershed, um, and you can see Lake Okeechobee at the bottom right, uh, and we have 14 dispersed water management projects going on in this watershed. 26,000 acres of treatment, uh, basically that's 26,000 acres of land that is set aside to hold water. Um, we speak in South Florida in acre feet, that's an acre of land with a foot of water on it. So we end up holding about 60,000 acre feet of water. Um, a foot in Lake Okeechobee is 400,000 acre feet. Uh, so it's, and, and then a lot of phosphorus gets removed, which is the pollutant of concern uh, for Lake Okeechobee. But that, uh, 26,000 acres is a lot of habitat. And it creates a lot of habitat in these areas. So I'm gonna talk about a few of these. So uh, Likes, the brothers company, uh, owns West Water Hole. Now this is a smaller dispersed water management project, but it's a heck of a workhorse. And you can see basically the, the concept is 
uh, we will partner with Likes Brothers. We will pay them for some capital. They will put basically uh, low, low level berms uh, at critical points on their property to hold water back at, with a control structure to release it you know, when it's raining too much, right? So you end up with this kind of landscape, um, but we pay them uh, basically an annual payment. What they're doing is they're setting aside land that was otherwise in being used for cattle grazing or crops or whatever it was. And we, instead of them using this land for that production, they're, they're partnering with us or we'll give them a payment. It's usually around 100 to $125 per acre foot of water that they can hold back on that land. Uh, to keep it on the land and protect Lake Okeechobee. So that's the primary goal of it, protecting Lake Okeechobee, but it creates incredible habitat. And you talk with any of these landowners who've put together one of these projects and they are astounded by what they see flock, literally flock, towards that project itself. Uh, this is Buck Island Ranch. Um, is Hillary in the audience? I think I thought I saw her. God, nope. All right, I'll get, I'll get you. Um, so Buck Island Ranch is a, uh, a working ranch. They do a lot of research on it, but they also hold water on that ranch. Um, and then really they've got scientists on staff that measure how much phosphorus is taken up, what's happening. There are cows grazing. Uh, it's a working ranch. And it is something that we partner with uh, routinely to do studies and research to figure out how we can hold water on land, have cattle grazing on land, and create a nutrient sink, if you will, for the protection of Lake Okeechobee. So it's another partnership. You can see it's in that Lake Okeechobee watershed as well. This is a, a big one. It's, uh, I think it's about 4,000 acres. This is Nicodemus Slough. It's on the west side. This is also a likes project. Uh, and it is, it basically takes water off of Lake Okeechobee. Let me figure out the size of this thing, because it's big. I can't get to it fast enough. So it's, uh, it pulls water off of Lake Okeechobee and basically runs it across the, the ranch. You know, from this side through the ranch and then back to Lake Okeechobee if necessary, if it doesn't seep in. Um, an incredible spot on the landscape, uh, very incredible natural areas, and Lake Okeechobee has a phosphorus pollution problem, so pulling it off of, of Lake Okeechobee uh, and getting it back to Lake Okeechobee is the key for this, uh, this area of landscape, which again, creates incredible habitat. So let's go over to the Caloosahatchee watershed. And so basically, when you have Lake Okeechobee in the middle, it can drain both east and west, and it, the Caloosahatchee watershed is connected to the lake right through the center diagonally of this map. Um, and then you have a few blue squares, and there we've got a couple of dispersed water management projects uh, that provide uh, almost 2,000 acre feet of storage. Uh, Lake Hickpachee, this is a district project. Um, this land used to be used for cattle and citrus, but it's a former lake bottom uh, that is now uh, getting protected for, uh, basically for protection of the Caloosahatchee estuary. Phase one is online, you can see it in this picture, uh, creating this kind of habitat. Uh, we can pump water in from the, the uh, canal that goes to the Caloosahatchee estuary that protects the estuary up into the uh, storage area and then it goes through a distribution canal uh, into the Lake Hickpachee itself uh, which is like a marsh lake um, and then phase two we're in design right now and should start construction next year but that adds another 2,000 acres to that project so it's, it can capture a lot of water before it gets to the estuary put it across a landscape uh, and make it more natural. Again, th these kind of acreage that we create these projects for really have a great habitat uh, component uh, and it really helps with endangered species, quite frankly. Uh, we, the, every time we build one of these, the snail kite population really comes to it. It's, it's pretty impressive. 
Uh, this is what we call the Boma facility. That's also on that canal that goes to Clusahatchee Estuary. Uh, it's about a 1,000 acre facility that, uh, again, same concept, but this is owned by the district. So let's go to the St. Lucie watershed where we're starting to see a lot more connectivity um, because of these types of projects the water management district is doing. And you can see on this map, those shaded areas uh, down towards the bottom, uh, the, blue, the bluish areas, that's a combination of comprehensive Everglades restoration, northern Everglades restoration, and, and uh, dispersed water management. So there are these different funding streams that we get that we can use those funding streams to create this kind of habitat connectivity. A number of those are comprehensive Everglades restoration. One of them is dispersed water management. And I think another one we're working on is gonna be Florida Forever in there. So it's, a, it's, a, it's basically what we try to, are trying to do in this watershed because the opportunity is there is to take these programs we're getting funding for and create that kind of connectivity both for the St. Lucie Estuary and for wildlife itself. And boom, I mean, the wildlife is crazy there. It's wonderful. Um, so right, let's see. So just north of that cluster is that triangle piece. That is Bluefield Grove. And this is a dispersed water management project where we've partnered with Evans Properties. And they've taken this former citrus field and put, you know, used the berms that were there, modified those berms, enhanced them, and then added a pump station. And we're paying them annually. Instead of trying to grow whatever crops they're trying to grow, they're farming water. There's another term we use called water farming. And so they've got, I think, about 2,000 acres here, and they're putting water on it. Uh, this just kicked off a year ago, and it's uh, getting a lot of water on it. And what they'll tell you is the roseate spoonbills, the redness because of the crustaceans that are there, the roseate spoonbills are about as red as you could ever get. And they're just landing on this property, flocking to it. Alapata Flats, that was a, uh, we just finished hydrologic restoration. This is our land that we purchased under comprehensive Everglades restoration. Um, and it is uh, basically, it's designed just to hold water naturally on the landscape. Plug the ditches, hold the water back. And this is the, about a year and a half ago, we, we finished the restoration there and that's the rele releasing a uh, bird back to the environment at that event. Uh, but that was uh, put together by us and uh, very, uh, very exciting. It's, that is about 4,000 acres. What I wanted to show this stormwater treatment uh, area, and this is a SERP project where you have a reservoir. It's gonna be a 15 foot deep reservoir, not really ideal habitat for Florida, but that's to save the St. Lucie Estuary. But right next to it is a stormwater treatment area, which is ideal habitat. They, I call them wildlife spas because you build these things and the wildlife flocks to it. And so you see some pictures. It just came online a couple of years ago. Um, I love going out there. It's not open to the public yet, but it will be next year if I have anything to do with it. But you need to go, you need to really take in the wildlife that goes there. There's a, a flock of white pelicans that hangs out just as you're driving in right there on the edge of the stormwater treatment area. And this, this little square up here, up in the upper right, uh, last Friday, uh, the ARC Council just approved it on the Florida Forever project list, but that's beautiful Buck Island Ranch. So we're, we're, we've partnered with Martin County to try to pursue acquisition there. Again, connectivity of all these areas. Final slide is the, uh, basically these are tools. I think most of us know what these are. Uh, we have a lot of cattle leases. They're very in, uh, important tools for our lands as we're waiting to put them into use for these kinds of projects. Uh, but we, and we allow them on our natural area lands that we have in conservation too because it's, uh, it's a great tool to keep the exotics under control and the ranchers in South Florida are consummate professionals at, and man, their lands look really good in South Florida. Um, and of course, prescribed burn, burning. But every other month we have a, uh, what we call a rec forum. It's our recreation forum where we talk to all the outdoors people. They come in. We talk about access to our natural areas um, for recreational opportunities. And it's always a good and lively discussion. 
but we've got about a million acres of land in South Florida Water Management District that a lot of the public enjoys. A lot of that is the Everglades. I've just talked about the Northern Everglades. Uh, but that's, uh, that, I mean, we're putting all these tools together to try to create these ecosystem habitats for the good of the downstream water bodies and the habitats themselves. That's the hook. That's the hook. All right, thank you. Thank you, Drew. Realize you had a lot of content to try to fit into uh, 10 minutes. So amazing work there within your water management district. So um, Katja, if you'll start coming up, this is Katja Cornwell. She's with the Florida Department of Transportation. And her focus is going to be creating imper impervious services and pervious services. So good afternoon, Katasha Cornwell, um, Department of Transportation, Office of Environmental Management. I'm an environmental administrator there, and I have the privilege of working on protected species and habitat-related initiatives. So today I wanted to briefly touch on some of the things that we're doing uh, with regard to enhancing our environmental screening tool so that uh, where we're building um, kind of a geospatial database to um, help us look at wildlife corridor solutions potentially. So I wanted to kind of reflect on just momentarily some of the things we've heard uh, throughout the summit so far, which, you know, big data is pretty important. I'm not sure if our data is big, but it's at least good data, I think, that we're being able to bring together into one location. Um, I think we heard yesterday the importance, too, of being able to make sure that that data is relevant and, you know, refreshed on a regular basis. So I think some of the things you'll see here is we're trying to do that. I think it's important, um, you, you know, we heard yesterday about understanding where wildlife are crossing the roadways and where that connectivity really needs to be. And I think, again, you'll see where the tools that we're working on bringing together um, will help us start looking at those solutions a little bit more holistically. So just to start off with, we've heard obviously a lot about partnerships, super important. We do have really good long-standing relationships with both our U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service partners and FWC partners. And we also have a fairly new relationship with the University of Central Florida, Dr. Dan Smith. He's obviously done a lot of work throughout um, the transportation um, industry over time, but our office specifically has a direct relationship with him at the moment to help us work on some of these initiatives. Uh, some of the things that we're gonna talk about today have come directly from the agencies themselves. Some, again, are coming directly from Dr. Dan's, um, Dr. Smith's work that he's doing kind of on our behalf as well as a few other partners. And then also um, some of this work is very collaborative with other NGO partners where the agencies are facilitating some of these conversations and um, helping us all work together to build some solutions. So with that, I think it'll be important for us just to talk about um, some of the existing tools that we already have in place. And those are um, some direction that we have to both our planners as well as our designers. So we already have direction to our designers when we're gonna work on a structure, whether that's you know, enhancing the structure from a maintenance perspective or maybe uh, widening a roadway. There's already direction to those designers to consider wildlife connectivity through our design manual. We also have a pretty robust wildlife crossing guideline and that set of guidelines was actually developed in coordination with the Panther Recovery Implementation Team, who I think you might have heard briefly about earlier today. And so those folks, along with our agency partners, helped us to develop a really robust set of guidelines that I think um, will help us look at these tools and put together, the, you know, using those guidelines, help us identify really good, important corridors for us to look at where we're putting wildlife crossing considerations into our projects. So before I touch um, on these particular tools here with regard to the panther, I do want to just say that our environmental screening tool that we use already in our project planning process has a lot of the really robust habitat data layers that you guys have heard about, the wildlife corridor specifically. All these habitat data layers are already included in the considerations that we have when we're looking at projects. But I think some of the things that we're building on, again, is this geospatial database idea that are species specific uh, tools and, and data sets that are gonna help us kind of marry together um, the habitat layers that we have, plus these sort of other modeling efforts and, and specific location efforts that we're looking at. So the first thing I'll mention is the Panther Recovery Implementation Team. Um, again, this is transportation sub team specifically, their hotspot modeling that they've done for the, the Florida Panther. So we're able to take that modeling effort and uh, make a geospatial database reference layer for that. 
and put that into our environmental screening tool. That tool gets updated on a regular basis by our district staff actually. They've kind of taken over that modeling effort and are able to update that annually. <clears throat> we also, of course, all are concerned about I-4 and that permeability and understanding as those panthers continue moving northward, that that's gonna be an area that we really all need to focus on together to find good solutions there. So that's also gonna be part of our geospatial database. So it's not all just about panthers, right? Bears are pretty important as well. And so FWC has provided us a number of different tools. Some of those include um, data layers that are already existing, like where we have existing bear crossing signs, but they also have other areas that they've looked at where maybe just adding some fencing at an existing structure would really help potentially reduce that wildlife uh, collision uh, up, you know, areas that are kind of um, important for us to try to reduce those, those locations. And so we've also got some information, and that's mostly in the Panhandle area. So I know someone also said that it's not all about South Florida, and we agree we're trying to kind of have a more holistic statewide approach. Um, but so the fencing opportunities are mostly in North Florida, but statewide, FWC has also looked at some pinch point data for the bears specifically. So again, as we have projects coming through those areas where there may be pinch points, we can kind of um, identify those locations as well as potential opportunities. So those again are some of our existing tools. And so now I wanna focus maybe on some more tools that I call are under construction. So they're uh, about to come online relatively soon. The first is our least cost pathways tool. And I say ours, but I really mean the Panther Recovery Implementation Team, which we're a part of. So again, Dr. Smith, pretty important player in this uh, <laughs> whole, Thing, but he has spent some time doing some really robust modeling, and I'm not going to pretend to understand all the modeling. I'm not a modeler myself, but he's taken um, both wildlife vehicle collision data, uh, telemetry data from panthers, um, looking at habitat layers, looking at existing structures, and really looked at how likely the panther is to cross from one location to another um, through these least cost pathways. So least cost to the panther as it's moving through the landscape and how is the panther most likely to travel. So I think as you see, as we start building upon these layers, so looking at the you know, hot spots that we already have, looking at adding these least cost pathways into our geo database, as well as some of the other tools that we'll talk about, they're gonna start building on top of each other. So we have a more robust uh, planning set of tools to help us identify where those next opportunities are. <clears throat> Another thing that Dr. Smith is doing uh, for DOT specifically is looking at hotspots statewide that don't just focus again on that panther and bear sort of um, iconic set of species. They're really looking at um, other large animals as well. Those sort of data are based on wildlife vehicle collisions again, so he can look at crash reports and other things to kind of glean some more about where those hotspots are. He's also looking at um, small animals, so I think that's really important. That's not an area that we've always had the opportunity to focus on. So <clears throat> he's taken uh, a set of models based on habitat and probability data of those small animals being in the vicinity, and he's been able to develop a model for wetland-dependent species as well as upland-dependent species. So we'll have three actual different data sets of hotspots for different uh, species to consider statewide. Another thing that we have under development is really bringing together all of our existing uh, wildlife crossing structures. It may seem like we should already have that in place, and that's kind of been a bit of a pet project of mine over the last couple of years, is trying to make sure we can gather all those data layers together in one spot so we have a better understanding of where we have existing wildlife crossings. We can, again, start layering these pieces of information on top of each other and identifying where that next sort of piece of the puzzle is so that we can kind of start planning for that next um, area for the uh, wildlife crossing opportunity. One thing that I think is super important that, again, Dr. Smith is working on, as, as well as FWC for us, uh, they're partnering together. They're looking at about 150 existing bridges and culverts that are not yet wildlife crossings, but have the opportunity to potentially be wildlife crossings with some enhancement, whether that's fencing again, thinking about that FWC sort of bear opportunity, whether that's maybe adjusting the riprap in a way that is more conducive for wildlife connectivity, or whether that might be building a shelf or other opportunities where we can provide you know, cost-effective enhancements that maybe we don't have to go out and build a whole 
brand new uh, wildlife crossing, which we all know is pretty expensive. So I think that this is a really important opportunity for us to capitalize on. And again, um, part of these uh, opportunities are really intersecting with those hot spots that Dr. Smith is looking at, as well as within you know, the wildlife corridor itself. So I think the results of this effort will filter out those most um, likely areas where we have opportunities to consider as we're developing projects um, coming online soon. I think just briefly, my take home message would be, while we have a lot of robust data, and this is a really exciting opportunity for us to bring it all together, we need to make sure that we're providing really good guidance to the folks that are gonna be using this data. So not only our planners and our designers, but our agency partners again, you know, the modeling can only go so far. We still have to have boots on the ground. This is a planning tool and it's, you know, providing us considerations and opportunity locations, but it's not giving us the answer. It's not telling us you need to build a crossing here or that this is the type of crossing to build. It's really, here's where the opportunities lie that are most important and take that next step to think about where and how that crossing can be built. But thank you so much for your time and I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. It's really nice to see the Florida Department of Transportation as a partner, and we're grateful for your commitment to wildlife crossing. So thank you for being here. So next, continuing with our tools and approaches with our local, regional, and state level uh, partners, we have the U.S. Fish and Wildlife to talk to us about tools and approaches. So Bob Carley, come forward, please. And I'll push to your next slide so you're ready. Let's see if I can make this work. All Thanks right. very much. Yeah. Do you want me to push your button? For no, you? I think I can do it. I get people pushing my buttons all the time. <laughs> Getting them taken care of on my own. Um, yeah, hi everyone. My name is Bob Carey. Um, I'm the division manager for environmental review for Florida. Um, we recently consolidated to one Florida office. So I'm currently stationed in Gainesville. Uh, my family's lived in the Florida area for about 30 years in Tampa. Um, I moved here about eight months ago from Northern California. So I've been with the Fish and Wildlife Service for about 12 years. Prior to that, I worked in the private sector. I worked as both a consultant as a timberland manager in Northern California. Um, so I want to talk a little bit today about uh, conservation planning tools. And I'm going to focus primarily on Section 10 of uh, the Endangered Species Act. So the Endangered Species Act 1973 was, didn't include any sort of authorization for incidental take for private landowners, only for federal agencies under Section 7. So they amended the act, uh, 78 or 82, I don't remember exactly when, but it basically revised the Endangered Species Act to provide some opportunities for private landowners or non-federal entities to receive incidental take authorization um, under a couple of different options. Um, at the time, it was only one option. Those, those options have increased over time um, and now, uh, habitat conservation plans are, are probably the one that people are most familiar with. We also have um, safe harbor agreements, uh, a little bit different, as well as candidate conservation agreements with assurances. Um, there are others, uh, but these are, these are uh, the most common ones and the ones I want to talk today about. And I think this might be the same red cockaded woodpecker, Thomas, you had in your slides, so I'm not sure who hijacked whose photo. I probably just pulled it off the internet, but it may not be the exact same one. Um, let's see, so going right along, um, kind of the differences between the different types of agreements. Habitat conservation plans generally allow for incidental take uh, for projects that can't avoid impacts to listed species. Um, the standard there is to minimize and mitigate to the extent, to the maximum extent practicable, uh, but they're really agreements that are entered into with um, folks that really have to do their job and they can't afford or can't avoid um, impacts to listed species. There's not always a bright line between these agreements, but um, we're working on that. This, this has been an, an issue for years and there's times when the different kinds of agreements mix and it's a little bit hard to distinguish one from the other. Safe harbor agreements are used in general um, when conservation actions that are being applied incidentally take some listed species. Um, the kind of classic example is a frog pond, you know, and there's a listed frog there. We want to make the, the pond bigger to improve the capacity of the frog to produce, uh, the pond to produce frogs. But knowing that, we're going to put a heavy equipment in that pond to make it bigger. And we're probably going to run over some frogs. 
Ultimately, we're improving the situation for frogs, um, so we were able to authorize incidental take under that kind of an agreement. Candidate conservation agreements with assurances. This is part of the uh, services um, no surprises policy at the same time that that came out. And it said if people were doing good things for species that weren't listed at the time, but maybe listed in the future, that we wouldn't hold that against them. It's kind of a no good deed goes unpunished type of scenario where the standard at the time was the actions that were taken by the applicant should be um, commensurate with the ability to avoid listing. So it was basically a recovery standard. That's been changed to some degree right now and it's really focusing on um, what's called a net conservation benefit. Um, you don't have to talk to the I can do that, sorry. I apologize if you can't hear me. I can try to talk louder too. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the benefits of safe harbor agreements. Um, you know, why would a landowner want to do this? Uh, basically, they receive assurances that additional land use restrictions won't be applied if a species shows up on their property or their actions in, um, draw species into their, into their areas. Um, and basically, it's, uh, if they're doing things that are improving the habitat, we're, we're not going to hold that against them. Uh, participating landowners receive a permit that authorizes incidental take if um, that results from their normal activities. And with safe harbor agreements in general, the property owner has the ability to return the property to the baseline, that, which cons consisted when the agreement was entered. Um, sometimes these are zero baseline situations where we know the habitat isn't currently occupied, they're going to do something that makes it more attractive to wildlife, uh, the species shows up, and now we have to take it back down to the, to the baseline um, due to our management activities. And you know, that's frankly okay. Um, and I've got some wolf pictures up here because I want to talk a little bit about Northern California and wolves and an example that um, I wanted to share with y'all. Um, you know, what kind of things need to be done under a safe harbor agreement? You know, if the habitat's in good shape and the species are using it and you're doing good things, Maybe you don't have to do anything else at all. Uh, and we're, we're willing to enter into those kind of agreements as long as you maintain those activities that are favorable to the species that we're trying to manage for. Um, let's see, what else I got? Times, at times there have been species that have been re reintroduced under these type of agreements. For example, um, Fisher in Northwestern California had been extirpated from that part of the state. The habitat was in good shape. It was a timber company that owned it. Uh, they helped us fund some research and decided, hey, you know, we've got some fishers in uh, British Columbia and, and uh, Oregon and Washington, and we can bring them down and reintroduce them in California. And that was actually a very successful exercise. Um, it was complicated, but it, it ended up working out. Um, those kind of things help the service because it helps us monitor uh, the responses of various species to different management actions. Um, and then if habitat needs to be improved, we try to develop specific things that can be done um, to address the problems that are facing species, for example, forest management, grazing, et cetera, some of the common land uses that I think um, you know, are applicable in this kind of conservation scenario. Bigger tools, uh, larger group tools. This is a Northern Spotted Owl. Uh, statewide safe harbor agreement that I was working on with the California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection prior to leaving the state. Uh, basically, it was large timber landowners that uh, agreed to manage their land in a certain way. They had gone through a fairly rigorous state review process, uh, and the Fish and Wildlife Service was actually very um, impressed with that situation. And we started working on a situation on a agreement to where private landowners could sign into that agreement that was held by the state. So it gets a little, a little bit more complicated, but basically at that point, the state was the permit holder. Private landowners could sign up. The state would issue them what's called a certificate of inclusion, and they would be also be covered. So I'm just gonna keep moving on. So this was the example that I wanted to share with you guys today. Um, this is a Butte Creek Ranch. It was a safe harbor agreement that our office did uh, probably starting in around 2013 or so. Um, this is a 3,400-acre cattle ranch in Northern California near Mount Shasta. Um, it was under a conservation easement with the Pacific Forest Trust. It was an easement in perpetuity. Um, part of the, our California Department of, 
uh, Fish and Wildlife helped write some of the management objectives for that plan and that, that agreement. Um, it was too high for northern spotted owls. Northern spotted owls don't typically nest above about 6,000 feet. This, this property is above 6,000 feet. But with climate change happening, we don't know where owls are going to end up. You know, snow levels are coming down and uh, things are warming up and vegetation is changing. And the landowners were concerned. They had mature forest timber on their property and they managed that timber to both try to reduce um, threats of wildfire and also just to improve the, the uh, timber production capacity of the property. Um, they didn't have owls, but it wasn't for certain that they weren't gonna have owls in the future. And then around 2012, and folks might have heard the famous wolf that had come in from Oregon, OR7. I don't know, that was kind of big news where I lived. Um, it was a wolf that had been banded, uh, collared rather, in Oregon and began a dispersal pattern, migration pattern, came down into California, milled around for a little bit. It was the first wolf documented in California since 1924. Um, that wolf bounced around a little bit between Northern California and Southern Oregon, um, d ended up reproducing in Oregon, that, that pair did. Um, but a few years later, 2015, some wolves started being detected, uncollared wolves started being detected in California. Um, and they set up shop right on the Butte Creek Ranch, probably within a half a mile. Um, and this is a cattle ranch, and the cattle ranchers were a little bit nervous about that. Uh, never been done in California before. This was the first time people had faced this situation in a long, long time. Uh, a lot of public um, concern, I suppose. But, you know, from our perspective, the land was being well managed. And the wolves were attracted to that site for a reason. Uh, the cattle management um, practices were exemplary. They had range stewards on site. They had cameras all over the place figuring out what was going on on this ranch. Uh, they had entered into an, agree an agreement, a conservation, or a habitat, um, I'm sorry guys. Conservation easement is the word I'm looking for. Sorry. Uh, that managed that property in perpetuity. This was a third generation family that had owned that property and they wanted to just keep doing what they were doing. And as long as they kept doing what they were doing, we thought, you know what, if this is attractive to wolves and if it becomes attractive to owls, um, that's a good deal for everybody. So we entered into that agreement. Um, I think it's working out pretty well. It is just one of those opportunities, one example of, of stuff that I wanted to share with you all today. Um, I don't think I got any more slides. That's it. Good. All right. All right. Thank I'm you, Bob. earning some minutes back. Yeah, that's right. Good job. Good job. Well, we've heard some really interesting perspectives on our regional, state, and now uh, national level with our um, state, with more of our regulatory agencies, right? So now we want to shift gears, and we want to talk about tools and approaches more on the public and private side. So with that, we have uh, four panelists. So, panelists, this is your order, and again, I uh, have the nine-minute clicker and one minute to finish. So, I'm seeing Kay move up. Uh, Kay Haviter is going to be talking to us more about mitigation banks and uh, her good work across the area related to mitigation banks. Okay, welcome. And if you'll hold your mouth, I think the, the key is to put the mic close to your mouth so that everybody in the back can hear. Okay. Thank you. So my name is Kay Hovader. I am um, with the Florida Association of Mitigation Bankers. I've been with them for, goodness, about six years. Um, and I rep we represent wetland mitigation banks and conservation banks throughout Florida. your inner button for your next slide. Perfect. We've been hearing a lot about panthers today, haven't we? And I'm not done yet. So we've been hearing a lot about the tools. Um, I'm going to be talking more about the approach and, and how we integrate a lot of the tools we've been hearing about into conservation banking and wetland mitigation banking. So my goal is to show how these mitigation banks and conservation banks can offer some unique opportunities to provide high quality restoration projects on private lands. 
um, that has been under threat for development in order to help fill some gaps through the Florida Wildlife Corridor by creating economic incentives to private landowners. So a refresher, I think most of us probably know what conservation banks and mitigation banks are, but for those that may not, um, conservation and mitigation banking is basically an ecosystem services market driven by the Endangered Species Act and the Clean Water Act. Um, they offset environmental losses basically with environmental gains done on property. Banks create credits determined using ecological assessments that certify specific value earned through the either preservation, restoration, or enhancement of wetlands or streams for mitigation banks are the protection and management of endangered or at-risk species in their habitat for conservation banks. Credits are then ultimately purchased by developers who are required to compensate for their project's unavoidable adverse ecological impact. So what are the purpose and goals of these compensatory mitigation banks? Mostly the goal is to aid in the recovery of the listed species and its habitat. We know that habitat destruction is often a key cause of population decrease. So establishing habitats that are properly maintained and protected help populations recover. Banking aids in protecting our diverse ecosystems more efficiently. The best environmental mitigation occurs not on smatterings of small individual mitigation sites, but on large pieces of land that are aggregated in places that are well protected, supports all ecosystem processes and are financed for long-term management and enjoy economy of scale. The technical expertise of banking makes it more efficient and not just in terms of cost, but also in the terms of the quality of restored acres. So what are some critical elements of conservation and mitigation banks? <laughs> Successful banks are highly regulated areas approved for their location, often next to already conserved areas, their large size, long-term protection, and financial strength. Whether publicly or pri privately owned, they are equally regulated by environmental agencies they provide benefits in advance of the impacts they offset and are only approved to offset impacts after they have pr been proven successful. Banks must be protected in perpetuity and advance funded for long-term management. So, I, so why there are some positives I've highlighted. Being heavily regulated comes with a lot of challenges and one of the biggest challenges is the length and process of permitting these banks. Um, and I can tell you that many of our private landowners have ultimately just kind of given up and gone the easier route with development because it can take anywhere from two to five years and sometimes even longer for wetland mitigation banks and two to four years for conservation banks for a variety of reasons. So that is a huge challenge that we have to overcome. Um, other challenges that we've had is, um, you know, we've heard the quote that change is the constant in life. That is certainly the case as in our, the banking industry. Um, po constant policy changes like we've seen with the water of the United States, um, the WOTUS rule, um, has created quite the challenge in the market. Um, and so we have to ki kind of learn how to navigate all those changes. Oh, I just see that I... Um, some other issues that, um, and challenges that we have to deal with are um, the lack of availability of large tracts um, in, in certain areas, um, especially in the highly developed areas. We are having really hard issues in uh, Sarasota County and Miami-Dade Broward County, and that's where you see a, a a lack of available credits um, for that very, very reason. So, um, moving on. So, you may ask how do conservation banks specific, uh, relate specifically to the Florida Wildlife Corridor? 
Currently, there are over 100 approved wetland and conservation banks throughout the state. And um, this kind of gives you an idea. The green dots are the, the approved wetland mitigation banks, and then the orange dots are the conservation banks. And then the green is basically just the wildlife corridor. Um, and so you can see the connectivity to many of our banks um, to the corridor. There is a total of 85. I think there's 68 wetland banks, and um, all 17 of our conservation banks lie uh, within the corridor, and I would specifically say that um, our conservation banks are all within that critical linkage area. So basically, this is, this is why banks play a role in the Florida Wildlife Corridor. We utilize the Florida Ecological Greenways Network data layer um, to pay a part in scoping for new bank sites as we move along. So we can be more strategic in identifying property that will help fill the gaps in the corridor. So I'm gonna spend the last couple of minutes just highlighting some, some mitigation and conservation banks that have done such a thing. This one is one of our favorites, Lake Livingston. It is a conservation bank, a sand skink conservation bank, and a um, wetland mitigation bank. Um, it is in, on the Lake Wells Ridge in Polk County. You will notice that the um, wetland mitigation bank is outlined in the blue area, um, and the sand skink conservation bank is kind of on the outskirts on the red. And um, it, that this, these banks together create a link between the west and east side of US Highway 27. Um, confirmed this morning, DOT does plan on creating um, there are a, a project in, in the works to widen US 27 in this area and plans on creating a wildlife crossing, which we heard Katasha talking about earlier um, in this area. Uh, yes. So that will help with uh, creating the link as well. So these are some pictures um, of documented endangered species on site. What, one of the ones, my favorite, is the panther, which means that this is north of the Caloosahatchee, which is a, a, this is a big deal. And so very exciting to see some of, this, um, some of these um, document, documented on site. The next we see is, we, we ha I'm going to highlight a couple uh, panther conservation banks. Um, the first one is the Panther Passage Conservation Bank which is located on 4,000 acres. It is this really light green kind of rectangular shape at the top. Um, you will notice its connectivity to um, conserved areas all around. Um, not only that, but it is also in the critical linkage area of the wildlife corridor and um, is located within the panther dispersal zone. The Florida Panther Conservation Bank. Um, is also, at, in fact, the Florida Panther Conservation Bank has multiple banks. The, the first bank, um, which was the first conservation bank in Florida, is located in the purple area. Um, and then um, its second bank is in that turquoise blue next to the Panther Passage Conservation Bank in that, that um, little cluster of, of conserved areas. Um, the bank sponsors worked with U.S. Fish and Wildlife to um, identify that specific site for the second bank um, based on the least, path cost, or least cost pathways that we just heard about earlier. Um, not only that, but also, again, these all are fit right in the uh, critical linkage area of the Florida Wildlife Corridor. And here are some more wildlife pictures um, on site. Multiple panthers and bobcats and then bears. And then I'm going to identify a couple of mis um, wetland mitigation banks that have used um, the the Greenways Network data layer um, to identify these specific sites. So the first one is Missing Link Mitigation Bank, which is yet again in Polk County. Um, 
It's a privately owned project and the bank sponsor specifically used this network data layer to identify sites because of its contribution to the corridor. The entire site was under imminent threat for low density residential development as had occurred on sites immediately um, adjacent to it. So uh, the site is the missing link, hence its name, um, between two large conservation areas and was targeted for acquisition as an essential parcel remaining in the Florida Forever project, um, referred to the Green Swamp High Lochi Corridor. And then the last one is, oops, my favorite, Chazowitzka Mitigation Bank, um, which is um, actually in Hernando County. Uh, located, it was, it created a link um, and kind of filled in a gap that was um, in the national, or in the wildlife management area um, and is bordered by the National Wildlife Refuge, um, some South Flor Southwest Florida should be, uh, conservation areas and the Wikiwachi Preserve. Um, so basically what's my takeaway out of all of this? My takeaway is this. Banks can create a financial incentive, and a, a pretty nice financial incentive, for con uh, conservation and can provide a unique opportunity to engage the private landowners by allowing them to maximize their land value. While there are a variety of tools that are implemented um, to determine strategic locations for bank sites to provide optimal connectivity and conservation, there are more, many more th things that need to be explored to address current challenges and threats to its success. Thanks. Very, I mean, my mind is just moving so fast, isn't yours? And I think, Kay, you may have taken my notes. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah, you just be me. <laughs> no problem. All right. So thank you again, Kay. Now, our next presenter is uh, Dr. Mark Penning, and we uh, heard a little bit from his colleague uh, yesterday about uh, Walt Disney World and their commitment within their wilderness track. So he, uh, he teed you up well, so we're excited about seeing the content, hearing the content about Walt Disney World and your commitment to the Wildlife Corridor. Mark? Thank you. And again, if you'll hold your... I will do my best and please feel welcome to remind me. Good afternoon, fellow champions of the Florida Wildlife Corridor. Lovely to be here. And uh, we are very proud um, of how we protect the magic of nature at Walt Disney World and the Walt Disney Company. Um, it's an ethos that goes all the way back to Walt Disney himself. Uh, we're excited to give you this very tiny peek into the value that we bring to the Florida Wildlife Corridor. And, you know, we have to contextualize it, right? This is a very interesting slide from the East Central Florida Regional Planning Council back in 2019. And it is rather disturbing, isn't it? Um, it shows Central Florida growth from 1974 on the left-hand side. Uh, through to today and into the future in that, that pink uh, color, whatever that is called. Um, uh, is it mauve? I'm not sure. Uh, but that shows future projected growth. And what it's estimating is that population growth and development uh, is going to reduce undeveloped habitat in this area by up to 340 miles and increase water consumption by up to 70% by 2050. So just some of the stark realities that we are facing. And right in the middle there is Walt Disney World, which of course is situated just around the corner from where you're sitting right now. What's also right here is the uh, headwaters of Reedy Creek. It's a watershed that runs 11 miles southwards through undeveloped habitat and it empties into Lake Russell at the Nature Conservancy's Disney Wilderness Preserve. From there, the waters feed Lake Okeechobee and ultimately the Everglades. So whatever management actions we take at Walt Disney World, uh, well, those impact on 
um, not just connectivity of habitat, but think about water quality over this vast and interconnected landscape of people and wildlife. Looking closely at uh, Walt Disney World, a um, little bit closer up, you get to see immediately that dark green uh, uh, area of uh, protected space. It's quite literally the green spine, isn't it, that runs through Walt Disney World. It is undeveloped land and will remain so in perpetuity. Uh, which I'm very pleased to say. But of course, we ask ourselves, what can we do not just with that land, but look at the adjacent lands that are developed or mixed-use land, and how can we contribute to the corridor with those as well? Uh, yesterday, my esteemed partner and colleague, Dr. Jason Fisher, shared with you uh, you know, that our undeveloped lands are, of course, the ideal, and uh, he showed you the importance of 8,000 acres that... Uh, um, we have preserved at Walt Disney World. It's about one-third of our property that is uh, protected in perpetuity. But what do we do with those mixed lands and uh, the developed areas? Well, one of the earliest examples uh, is a system of canals on Disney property. Uh, canals that obviously provide a habitat for aquatic species um, to a large extent, but perhaps more importantly, they ensure that water from our torrential downpours that we experience pretty much every afternoon through the summer can move right through our property and still feed into the Reedy Creek watershed. Here's a, a really different one for you. At uh, Walt Disney World, we happen to have elephants, black rhinos, and giraffe, not a wildlife that is wildly seen in uh, Florida. But this gives us quite a unique opportunity from a landscaping perspective because those are browsers and we need to feed them. Um, we have about 8,000 pounds of food that we give our animals every single day and we grow uh, a lot of that ourselves in browse fields to provide that food. Um, and of course we have a lot of wildlife that uses that space as they move through, but it saves us having to transport uh, and bring in, import, um, vast amount of food for these amazing creatures that we hold. Wherever um, we need some, uh, shall we say, aesthetic landscaping um, throughout our, our resorts, we like to leverage pollinator gardens um, to do just that. Uh, pollinator gardens give wonderful habitat for, for uh, pollinating species, but they also give our guests a really intimate connection with nature during their stay at Walt Disney World. We've got pollinator gardens throughout the resort, and our Disney Conservation Team Wildlife uh, surveys those on a regular basis to look at pollinator diversity and abundance. And uh, again, one of those things we're really proud of. Birds abound at Walt Disney World. And uh, we have a Christmas bird count that takes place each year, modeled on uh, the Audubon Christmas bird count. And our Disney volunteers have recorded 150 species of bird in a day uh, at Walt Disney World and uh, on the property. Even uh, I think that is a Merlin, right, that showed up unexpectedly uh, uh, one year. But I thought that was pretty impressive. And, of course, many of these species are overwintering or migratory species, and uh, they're relying on habitats in both the undeveloped land and the mixed-use landscapes. At Disney's Animal Kingdom, we can be very intentional about creating landscape habitat in many areas for local wildlife. Uh, it just fits the theme of the park, right? Our horticultural team creates these wonderful green spaces, and we have seen over 173 bird species uh, at Disney's Animal Kingdom, um, which, again, you know, that's excluding any of our... Disney Animal Kingdom birds. Um, and these birds, again, think of all the additional reptiles, amphibians, and insects that make their home there as well. Besides providing that important habitat, just think of how Disney's Animal Kingdom gives us opportunities to share stories with our guests. 
We have millions of guests that come through the park every single year, and we do our utmost to inspire them to care about nature. We create magical wildlife experiences for them every single day. We also have golf courses, four of them. <clears throat> and uh, the four courses at, um, at Walt Disney World have been certified as Audubon Cooperative Sanctuaries since 1999. That's through Audubon International's Cooperative Sanctuary Program for golf courses. But we went a step further as well. We developed an environmental management plan for these golf courses. We, we look at uh, very carefully mapping natural habitats, uh, looking at expanding naturally vegetated shorelines and pollinator meadows. We've even uh, put additional artificial nesting habitat for declining bird species, participating in community science projects, uh, looking at waste management, and of course reducing the amount of water that gets used uh, on the golf courses. Now this aerial photo, um, it actually shows the, the brown blotches there are the rapid infiltration basins. Um, but what I wanted to draw your attention to is that this is one of our solar farms. And uh, we as the Walt Disney Company have committed to be uh, well net zero from an emissions perspective by 2030, which is a very ambitious ask. Perhaps even more important is we've committed to 100% zero carbon electricity by then. So this particular array is producing 57 megawatts uh, already. Um, and uh, by January, we will have uh, gone up to 212 megawatts. That What that means uh, for context is that <clears throat> during the day, while the sun is shining, we can um, basically run the whole of Walt Disney World. Now... We had to ask ourselves, you know, when you build um, a, a, an array like that, there are species of plant that you want to move out of the way. We did that first. But just think about it. Why can't it be pollinator habitat as well? So what we did is uh, we experimented with a range of uh, seed mixes to provide great pollinator habitat as well as maximizing the energy output of those arrays. So we've already documented more than 40 species of pollinator, uh, including our state butterfly, which for those who don't know is the zebra long wing, but also monarch butterflies and a variety of uh, bees and such like that, um, that you just wouldn't believe it unless you went and saw it yourself. And then very quickly, just from mitigation banking perspective, I won't go into this right now because we're on nine minutes, but we have the Miralago site that is just about uh, 20 miles away, uh, right uh, immediately adjacent to the um, Disney Wilderness Preserve. Um, I will stop with that. So what I would like to finish off with is, uh, is to share that our Disney Conservation Fund, uh, on top of this work happening on our property, has already directed more than $120 million to field conservation projects around the world. And we're so proud of that. Our team who manages that program is sitting right over there. Well done, team. Um, on top of that, just picture what's possible when all of us work together to protect the magic of nature. Uh, we at Walt Disney World and the Walt Disney Company are so proud and so privileged to partner with all of you here and contribute in a meaningful way to protecting the Florida Wildlife Corridor. Thank you so much for your attention. Mark, thank you. What an amazing example how large businesses can still make money, be profitable, be but also be mindful of our wildlife and uh, the ecologies in which you own property. So thank you for your commitment in being with us today. So next we have up affectionately known as Farmer D. Uh, Darren Jaffe is going to be coming here and talking to us about agri-hoods. And for that, that was a new term for me. So, uh, Dr. Farmer D, I'm excited about your work and uh, for the group to learn more about it. Thank you, Lynn. Um, I can't wait to tell my kids that I got to follow the Disney guy from the Animal Kingdom. <laughs> so cool. A um, little intimidating. 
follow Disney, but I'm excited to be here. Um, thanks for having me. Um, my name is Farmer D. I've got a firm called Farmer D Consulting. We're a team of planners, farmers, landscape architects, um, and we work kind of at this intersection of conservation, agriculture, and development. Um, I'm going to share with you, we, we've been really fortunate over the last, I got into this through farming, and then kind of got into landscape architecture, and then got into this really interesting work that um, called agrihoods, which we call kind of farm conservation communities. Um, I got an opportunity a few years ago to help support a national effort to study agrihoods, and we were created a, a co-authored a report called Agrihoods, Cultivating Best Practices um, with the Urban Land Institute. It's a new and emerging, it's a very old idea. It's about as old as it gets, right? We lived in villages on the land, but it's a new idea getting some traction in the real estate world. Um, and it's, um, we've been fortunate to work with a lot of developers and a lot of private landowners as farmers are transitioning their land and they're in the path of development. And more recently, a lot of work with counties and cities getting the opportunity to look at a more regional scale, um, which is really exciting. And one of the great things about um, being a part of this effort is how we can bridge kind of preserving agricultural land, um, conservation land, and still meet the need for housing, right? We know development is, is, is a necessary thing, so how do we do it in a way that can help um, kind of protect those things? Oops, sorry, I thought I was on that slide. So the intersection that I talked about of conservation, agriculture, and village, um, really what, what this talk in you know, 10 minutes I'm gonna try to touch on is kind of our philosophy and principles about how we approach this idea of agrihoods. There's a big spectrum of, of agrihoods from you know, very suburban developments that incorporate a farm or a garden to really true conservation communities. And we kind of work in that spectrum and try to really promote more of the conservation-oriented approach to planning. Um, and so, you know, obviously the, the goal when we, in our approach is we start with kind of an ecological analysis and really look at where are the most sensitive areas naturally, the wetlands, the, the, the watershed, the habitat, the forest, the prime farmland, um, we really study that and understand kind of what is most important to protect and preserve and work our way back into then how do we cluster development to minimize the impact on those natural and agricultural assets and maximize the integration and benefit that people can have with those areas. Um, and that's where kind of the activation of the farm and the natural areas comes in play. So I'm going to share a couple of the principles that come with this work. Um, this is just an example of um, kind of a concept of clustering development in order to preserve the, uh, the, the, the natural areas and the farm. It's a real project outside of Atlanta. It's 20 years old now um, that we've been involved in since the beginning. And the main components are conservation first, pedestrian priority, right? We've designed everything around the car. And so we really want to think about that, flip that upside down and think about how do you design for pedestrian priority, minimize the impact of the car, um, and maximize the opportunities for conservation. And then really thinking about integrated workplaces. You know, how do we really think about people reducing the trips and traffic in and out and creating more of a vibrant local economy and places for people to work in community, on the land, um, on the farm, in the natural environment, education, et cetera, um, makers and such. And then really looking at mixed housing types and thinking about mixed income communities and, and different, you know, different people needing different things and not just kind of spreading single family residential, trying to maximize profit, but really how do we create great communities, diverse communities, inclusive communities. Um, and then how, uh, health and resiliency, which really runs through all of this, right? How do we create healthy places that are also resilient? Um, and so, you know, the principles basically apply, those same principles apply no matter where you are. If you're in an urban, in town, a, a, a suburban or a rural area. The things that basically change are kind of, we look at the context, the character of the area, the zoning, right, the infrastructure. We think about, you know, typically we try to aim for, you know, in a in a in-town urban environment, like up to 50% conservation. In a suburban area, 50 to 70% conservation. And in a rural area, you know, 70 to 90% conservation. And when we think about conservation, we're thinking about not conservation of things that already can't be developed, but conservation of the buildable area. So those percentages we typically try to apply to, you know, how much of this is, is actually buildable. Let's protect those percentages of that potential buildable land. And the main tool is, is clustering development. But really, you know, typically planning often happens from an engineering kind of maximizing 
how much you can put on the land and you spread things out and you know what we're kind of reverse engineering not starting with engineering um, and how much can you kind of how much development can we maximize but how much conservation can we maximize right and how can we reduce the development footprint to the smallest possible opportunity and still create a great place to live um, and so some of the lifestyle benefits from a community perspective is you can work where you live creating those workplaces and and, and also places for people to shop um, and and get their services in the community um, mixed housing different types of housing for different types of people economic all types of different um, age you know making it intergenerational and inclusive providing community services walkability and bikeability we love this um, concept that we've kind of developed, we call an ag meander, and it's really looking at kind of trail connectivity and integrating nature, agriculture, and places to, to gather um, and connect. And so we kind of look at this larger context of um, how to create walkability and bikeability. And education, you know, I've been hearing this theme throughout the whole conference, it's so important, right, that people really understand the value of conservation and they see the, the benefits um, and of, of local food and, and um, farming. The one thing I didn't really get into in the beginning, but it ties into conservation, is this idea of green space connectivity. Green belts are kind of, you know, something we've talked about. Agricultural connectivity, you know, this ties to wildlife, to watershed, to, um, you know, not fragmenting our, our, our farms and our own open spaces. So when you can think about things at a regional scale and kind of work your way into, well, where does development really even make sense in this region? And how can we, I, I live in an area now, um, it's kind of a, a, a interesting story. I came full circle. I started a farm in a place called Serenby 20 years ago. It's one of the early projects I worked on south of Atlanta. And after being all over the country and living out west and escaping the fires, ending up at Disney World with my, my kids as a, 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 a congratulations, you just survived six months in an RV during COVID, homeschooling, while we were looking for where to move, um, we ended up across the street from Serenby again to, um, and seeing it now 20 years later, it's really developed. And we're working in the whole, the whole region around Serenby is called the Chattahoochee Hills. And it's a 40,000 acre region. And the zoning overlay is 70% conservation villages and hamlets. And I've had this opportunity now to work with the city to map all the, and actually partnering with the American Farmland Trust, um, Billy, who's coming up next, to look at how do we conserve these farms before they're too expensive and it's just a bunch of estates. You know, hobby farms and estates, it's basically like rural gentrification happening. And so there's a huge amount of work and effort. Um, I could talk at length about the strategies for that. But this is the most important toolkit, I think, is conservation development, you know, these agri-hoods, but really through a lens of conservation, watershed health, restoration, regenerative ag, biodiversity, and community involvement. And my, my favorite part is the farm activation. Um, I wrote a book in 2014 called Citizen Farmers. And I'd always envisioned kind of building some kind of a movement around it because we're all farming by proxy. And thanks to my nine-year-old son last year, he started his own farm at the farm I started 20 years ago um, called TNT's Vegetables. And we did a CSA for 10 families um, for 10 weeks. And now this year we launched a nonprofit, Citizen Farmers Academy, and we've activated the farm at Serenby with a bunch of kids growing food and learning about farming and business and actually we're farming citizens is what we like to say. Um, and that's really where like the community comes together around food and around farming and we're teaching the kids and bringing the seniors together to work and mentor the kids and learn together. Um, and we're activating the local economy with the food that we're growing, right? And activating farm stands and markets and new value added products and creating a sense of place for this region that gives it its kind of terroir, it gives it a, you know, opportunities for ag tourism and ecotourism and it creates a local economy for farmers um, to be able to make a living and uh, be a part of community. And so that is, I got it right before my buzzer even. Sorry, I, don't, I didn't take enough breaths, but I think I got through the gist of it. Um, so we're actually, we've been working in Florida quite a bit. We have projects in the Panhandle for the last 15, 20 years, um, some active projects there, a few, quite a few projects around Orlando. Um, and just recently a few new projects in Southern Florida. So I'm getting to know, this has been a really great conference for me to learn more about all these incredible initiatives and resources and partners working together. Um, and it's beautiful to see the com coming together of conservation and agriculture. And um, I guess the least amount I see here is the development um, sector. But I think there's this, we, we can only make this work if we work together, right? It really takes a, a collaborative effort to address some of these huge challenges that we're facing. 
but it's exciting to be a part of it, and I appreciate it. How would you like to be in a room with Dr. D and Tony from yesterday? Think about the energy, the power, the knowledge, the entrepreneurship, and the big thinking uh, between these gentlemen that we have heard today and tomorrow, yesterday and today, I should say. But thank you. But you gave a good tee up to Billy Van Pelt. He is going to be talking about now the agriculture lands and had an opportunity to have a Zoom conference call in advance of this and just the awe-dropping work that Billy and his team is doing. I know you're going to be excited about what he says. So, Billy, if you'll come back up and talk about your great work. Thank you, Lynn. First, let me say that I'm truly honored and grateful to have been invited to be here with you all today. And it's really me saying wow for all the work that you all are doing here in Florida. Um, I've been coming here for the last, about the last six years since I started with American Farmland Trust and I met with Mallory for the first time about five years ago. And yesterday was the first time I heard all of these data points in the same room at the same time. So. Congratulations, you all are doing great work here. American Farmland Trust, for those of you that don't know, um, we are the, um, we're the uh, national nonprofit, the only one that approaches agriculture holistically. We're 41 years old. We were started by Peggy Rockefeller, who was on the board of the Nature Conservancy. And over the last 41 years, we have worked with partners to permanently protect nearly 7 million acres of land and another 300 million through sound farming practices. Before I go any further, I'll say that we are a land trust, but it's really less than 5% of what we do. And we don't go into areas where there are existing land trust entities or boots on the ground because we don't want to hold easements where there are existing resources and manpower. So I just want to make sure I'm very clear on that point up front. We do hold easements, but only in places where there aren't, there's not another viable option. We're based in Washington, D.C., and we have seven regional offices around the country, and I'm one of 150 employees nationwide, and about half of our employees work remotely, and I'm one of those. I'm based out of our Louisville, Kentucky office, and um, I work across the southeast in Texas, as Darren said. Um, we work together some, and I'll be at Serenby next week. So some of our past accomplishments, talking about farms under threat, um, is the report that came out in May of 18, which was a national look backward. We lost 11 million acres between 01 and 16, which is 2,000 acres a day, to development. Our most recent report, the second phase, was released in May of 20. And this is a state-by-state -state analysis of policy and spatial analyses, every state in the continental US. I have the spatial analysis for Florida for everyone in this room if you want a copy at 11 by 17. So the third phase of this project is what I'm talking about today, and this is county-level data. And specific to uh, the wildlife corridor, we know that there is wildlife corridor on ag lands across the US. And that's what we're mapping and as part of this third phase of county level data. And let me say that our micro site for this project is farmland.org backslash farms under threat. You can go there. And we are able to, uh, through a confidentiality agreement with the NRCS, we have um, access to data uh, and we have we are mapping all of the remaining productive, versatile, and resilient soils in the U.S., and that's part of this data. So this third phase focuses on wildlife habitat and connectivity corridors um, in Florida and around the country. These are some of the species that we're focused on in some of this county-level work. I'm directly involved in county-level projects in um, South Carolina and Texas, and we are talking with a, a few counties here in Florida about launching these pilot projects here. 
So some of the deliverables from this work will be to model development threats through 2040 and climate threats through 2040 and 2060, offering policy solutions and inspiring and guiding actions as a national organization, and to produce two distinct but linked analysis and reports. So we're mainly looking at how much agricultural land will be developed to other uses between 16 and 40, um, talking about urban and highly developed land, low density residential, and how much can be mitigated through smart growth and farmland protection. And by way of background, I'm a landscape architect. I've been working in farmland protection and land use for over 25 years, and I ran a purchase of development rights farmland protection program in Lexington, Kentucky for 10 and a half years. So we know what urban, highly developed land looks like. I won't spend too much time on that slide. The low density residential, you know, nearly half of the land that was converted in Florida between the study period um, of the last report from 01 to 16 was for low density residential development. The McMansions, the estate lots are, as we say in Kentucky, too much to mow and not enough to grow. And so that we're gonna be modeling three different scenarios in this next um, phase. So there's the, the let me go back here. The business as usual scenario, historical trends continue, low density sprawl proliferates, runaway, then runaway sprawl is a second scenario, and then better built cities where you have communities that choose efficient growth, new development is denser, more livable, and many more farms remain. So if you look at this on a spectrum of development efficiency, we have the business as usual where historical trends continue, the runaway sprawl, which is less efficient, and the better built cities, which is more efficient with less rural sprawl. So looking at Florida, and, and this is a state by state look that we're doing this at county level, urban development suitability, um, this projection, uh, which we're doing around the country, um, the red that you see is urban and highly developed land um, projected through 2040. The orange is low density residential projected through 2040 and the blue is coastal flooding by 2040. So we can account for local zoning, water availability or uh, climate migration as the caveats here. And some of the future deliverables are the executives, the report itself, an executive summary, and um, web map and GIS layers that you'll all be able to access and other release events and outreach such as webinars that we did in the last phase from state to state. So we're looking at climate threats to agriculture and um, how key crops will shift and erosion, for example. So some examples here show the shift in ag land cover suitability between 2020 and 2060. Uh, crop suitability as well, 2020 to 2060 with the, the lighter color being suitable and you see the change there 40 years later. Um, the increased erosivity from rainfall by 2040 and some other caveats here in terms of adapting for crop switching or changes in agricultural markets. Um, some of the expected outputs, as I mentioned uh, before, are listed here with an ex the expected launch date of the, this next phase. And then just some other modeling that we're, you can see here um, on how this is going to be done. Again, focusing on our nation's most productive, versatile, and resilient soils. These are the soils that are going to take us through climate change. And then predicting the probability of ag land types being found in a given location under two emission scenarios and so on. So I will say that, I may have gone on to your slide here, but just we in the breakout sessions that I had in Josh's session, we talked about some of the tools in the toolkit for planning for the future of agriculture. And just very broadly, they are urban growth boundaries, large lot minimums in rural areas, having a goal for farmland protection in comprehensive plans, and ag zoning. So one thing that I've learned is that the, your, comp, your comp planning process as outlined by statute does not have 
a, a carve out for agriculture. So we talked about how that might be accomplished. And if, if this could be presented to the legislators or to the governor in such a way that with ag being such a conservative space, that having um, a, an ag component in comprehensive plans would actually help you attract millions of dollars for farmland protection to Florida. AFT helped to secure $2 billion in the Farm Bill for Farmland Protection in 2018. Our team's already working on the 2023 Farm Bill. And the other one is to hire a consultant to, to do a rural land management plan for your county. If you go to Lexington Fayette Rural Land Management Plan, that's a guiding document that we produced in the community that I'm from in Lexington, Kentucky. It looks at all aspects of your rural area. And that is adopted as part of the comprehensive planning process. Sprawl uses more in services than it pays in taxes. AFT's done over 80 cost of community services studies. Ag uses less in services than it pays in taxes. So sprawl is not sustainable environmentally or uh, physically, financially. So go to our website, farmland.org, farmlandinfo.org, which is a clearinghouse of all of our research and data by subject and state, or farmland.org backslash farms under threat. Thank you. Well, I can imagine we've got lots of questions. So I'm going to ask my fellow board member that I see just right here, Gage, and somebody's left their cell phone up here. Um, so I'll leave it where I'm sitting. Billy, is that yours? Gage, if you'll tag with me, this is our opportunity for question and answer. I'm going to give you this microphone. And as people raise their hand, So this is your opportunity. We've got about five minutes with this because we really did run out of time uh, because in a few minutes we've got to close the uh, rooms off and each room goes to their separate next session. So welcome the opportunity. If our seven panelists will come up with me and um, that way we can answer questions more effectively and uh, efficiently. And so if you have a question to a particular uh, panel member, we ask that you say their name first. So I'll step away from the mic and they can step to the mic and gauge. If you'll just kind of work the room, you're going to be Oprah for us and, um, and, and go to where the individual is that is asking the question. So if you have a question now for one of our panel members, we welcome you to raise your hand. Gage will find you, and then again, if you'll say who the question is for, so they can move up here to answer the question. Any questions? So far, I, I see one hand. Okay, Gage. It's it's a little bit more of a of a comment, but it does speak a bit to uh, what Billy was speaking about in, okay. as far as engaging agriculture, and in the Suwannee and Santa Fe River valleys, uh, there's a lot of agricultural land, producer land, and silviculture land, which is quite different from the rest of the state and some of the other regions that the corridor goes through. And of course, the Suwannee River is part of the corridor, um, but if we're talking about any kind of water quality benefits or water quantity benefits, you're really looking at the uplands and the agricultural areas and the silviculture areas in the Suwannee Valley. And so uh, the Santa Fe River is not part of the wildlife corridor right now. Um, I think that there's been a lot of discussion around that. Um, but this idea of there are different types of producers in the state, especially in the northern part of the state, um, that we want to make sure are, are at the table and, and part of kind of the stakeholder engagement um, that will be impacting the corridor and, and benefits in the corridor. So I have a thought for you. You're in uh, our session, right? So we're fixing to have a charrette, and that's one of our deep questions that we'll be answering in the in the charrette. So unless one of our panel members has a comment, well, Jason, don't you think we'll be addressing that as part of the charrette? Okay. 
but does anybody of the panel members have something to add? Okay, all right, next question. Yes. Lynn, could I just kind of respond to that? Sure. I'll say that you're exactly right. Um, when we, uh, when American Farmland Trust helped launch the Purchase of Development Rights Program in Lexington, Kentucky, it's a quasi-governmental nonprofit corporation, and it has a board of directors, and that board includes a realtor, a builder, a convention and visitors bureau, a chamber person, and also, but also farmers and neighborhood folks and so forth. But you're exactly right. If the development community is not at the table, um, they're going to feel alienated by the conversation. And the other part of it is we're protecting these places because it's a quality of life issue. The corridor is a quality of life issue. It's a statewide macro level quality of life issue in the, in the smaller farmland preservation efforts in, in the county level, it's the it's the global brand. You know, Lexington, if you've been there, without our horse farms and our farmland, it's just a mid-sized city with a good basketball team. So <laughs> we consider we consider our farmland our ocean. I mean that's what we we consider our farmland our ocean. And that's why it's important to have the developers at the table. Just to add one one comment to that, I mean I, th I noticed this morning in the McKenzie presentation there was a mention of that the, the real estate value broadly was not factored into the, you know, $30 billion value that the quarter presents. And it would be really interesting to figure out how you can put a number on it because so many of the developments we work with, the value, you know, if you look at just the spreadsheets of the farm and the community and, you know, it's hard to justify, you know, investing in a, in a, in a farm. But the value that it brings to the bottom line of the overall project is huge, right? So when you start to see that people want to move to these places and they will pay more and there's a premium that comes across, a, and that you just scale that up to a, you know, to a, a county, a region, a state, you can really see some huge real estate um, values and how, do we, how does that get measured and how does that get invested back into these conservation and farm efforts? You know, it's a big question. Okay, now I have a question for you in the audience. Have you heard all of our representatives, whether it was from a governmental entity or more the private sector, and you heard their tools, you heard about their approaches, do you have examples of tools and approaches that you could add to the conversation? And if so, raise your hand, engage, we'll find you. And if you'll give us your ideas of missing tools that we should be thinking about, we'd like to hear about those now. Yes. Well, Bob Bendick from the Nature Conservancy Gulf Mexico program. Uh, climate change, uh, poses risks of flooding and fire and all sorts of other bad things happening to communities. And the, the, a tool that has not been mentioned is the value of protecting open space and natural features as a protection against uh, climate change impacts. And that value has, has a monetary value as well as a human value. Okay, super, thank you. There are over 32 of them up here that I heard. I'm sure I missed some that you all mentioned. Uh, but Bob, is that one that you're talking about in the pipeline, something that you'd like to see, or is there something like that that's already available? Well, they're called nature-based solutions, and 
they're uh, the cutting edge of what's happening and cut across all these sectors of what we've heard this morning. Um, but no one was very explicit about uh, the change in risk posed by climate change and, and uh, extreme weather and the value of open space to guard against that risk. All right, thank you. Any other tools, approaches that you see missing and hasn't been part of our conversation yet? Uh, Del Schwalz with the Florida Floodplain Managers Association. And to bounce off what was just said, um, there's currently a program, uh, 468 of the 478 communities in Florida are in the National Flood Insurance Program to manage their flood risk. 244 of them are in the Community Rating System Program, which provides discounted flood insurance to residents for communities doing higher standards. And one of the primary functions for gaining credit in that program is preserving open space in the floodplain and quantifying that in uh, combined greenway areas and habitat connectivity. Uh, so there's an existing framework in that with 244 of the communities in Florida, and they, get, they already have regulatory authority, community engagement support for those activities. So if we can connect that activity, which uh, is often uh, NOAA, Digital Coast, has a tool to map that open area and to quantify that, if we can connect that activity to this group and can, um, provide that connection there, especially in our um, under-resourced communities where a lot of that land is, is up for grabs because it's not mapped floodplain, there's no regulations in place, there's no staff to pursue anything outside of the regulatory framework. Um, so we can connect those dots, we have a tool ready to go. All right, so say that name again and how we can find more information about it. Um, it is the Community Rating System, CRS program, Okay. and it's Activity 420. Activity 420? 20, which is open space credit. All right, Jason, you got that? I think so. Okay. Yes, sir. All right, I see another hand raised. Thank you. Uh, Buck McLaughlin, the Range Operations Officer at Avon Park Air Force Range. I'm actually speaking on behalf of the Central Florida Regional Planning Council that I believe did a session earlier today in the in the science track. They are have initiated a pilot project to look at zoning and permitting as a way from a planning perspective to assess the developability, if that's the right word, of a particular parcel and how long or how far along in the process of of getting those requirements in place if you were going to develop it, what what stage that is. And I, I think that's going to be a, a really good tool to assess the potential for development on a particular property and how far along that particular landowner has gone in that process. And that's under the Central Florida Regional Planning Council? That, that's correct. Okay. Jason, you got that? Got it. All right. Time for one more. Debbie Osborne, Conservation Foundation of the Gulf Coast. And at our session, um, McKinsey uh, folks talked about incentivizing um, additional incentives for the programs that we have. We also know that um, the numbers don't work unless we get donations of um, perhaps conservation easements. And while there is an excellent federal benefit for the donation of conservation easements, some states have actually been able to um, set in motion programs where you can sell those tax credits to other people who can use those tax credits. If the landowner is land rich and cash poor, there's still a way to commoditize that. Very good, very good. Well, I know we could stay for 30 minutes to an hour longer and continuing this com great conversation, but we do have each session, each track, does have a next opportunity for further further this discussion. So let's say this piece is adjourned now, so that session two is adjourned.